Hi, welcome to another of the videos in the Sewing and Learning program at the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. Um, my name is Amy Huffnagel. I'm the Director of Programs and Visitor Experience at the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm joined today by a board member of the Stowe Center, but also an amazing contemporary artist, Roxana Alger Geffen. And Roxana is here as part of the suite of programs that circulate around our sewing project and craftivism project um, to really take us into a contemporary artist's view and other artists working with sentimental texts or texts as a component of their work. Um, Roxana, it's been a privilege to work with you on this project. So glad to have your voice and your um, a uh, helping us look at activism and agency and creativity as part of the suite of ideas we're playing around with today. I'm so glad to be here, Amy. It's been really, really interesting and fun for me to be part of this project. Um, I've done lots of research, which I kind of love, and gotten to meet um, all of the other uh, really interesting women who've been part of this project as well. So I'm very excited. It's good. so great. And um, we um, think a lot about words at the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center and the meaning of words um, and how they have resonance. I think that we're sort of existing in a contemporary moment where words are being um, co-opted and used against us or used in really complicated ways. And this project is looking for um, agency around um, how we activate our words. So let's get right to work. Okay, great. All right. So uh, my part of the talk, uh, my talk as part of the workshop uh, is called Always And. Um, it is about the idea of Oh, excuse me, let me go back there. It's about the idea of craftivism and the work of three artists, Dr. Sean Kimber, Diana Waymar, and me. My talk is called Always And because this kind of work is filled with and energized by opposition. Stitching itself and craft um, is both traditional and revolutionary, delicate and robust, quiet and loud. Stitching itself is a contradictory act. You pierce the fabric in order to make it whole. All the protection and comfort we associate with domestic textiles like quilts, blankets, and clothes begin with these small acts of violence, cutting and piercing. Even the cloth itself is made of fiber that has been stripped or plucked or sheared. Um, in this slide, I list verbs associated with fiber techniques um, divided into two lists. On the left, we have acts of separation and destruction. On the right, we have acts of unification and creation. Every fiber technique needs both kinds of acts. And just as the line in the middle here where the red and green panels meet, which vibrates with visual energy, so the combination of opposing forces energizes stitching. Craftivism and the work of the artist I will show you embraces stitching's contradictory nature. It joins the personal, among other things, the personal and public, text and image, small acts and big impacts. In the face of social or political necessity, of injustice and inequity, how do we as individuals make change? How do we turn our feelings of powerlessness and isolation into acts of power and connection? And what use is a private practice of making in the face of systemic injustice? Betsy Greer um, gives us some answers to those questions. Greer, who's often called the godmother of craftivism, first wrote about the term in 2002. She has a master's in sociology and is a writer, curator, and crafter. She writes about craft, activism, community, and self-expression. In her 2014 book, Craftivism, the Art of Craft and Activism, she reflected on ideas she'd been developing since the late 1990s. She presented interviews with 33 artists, crafters, and makers. And this slide shows um, three statements from the introduction to that book, which I think are crucial in understanding the idea of craftivism. The first one, the creation of things by hand leads to a better understanding of democracy because it reminds us that we have power. 
To some, our work may seem unimportant, but to me, the small scale of craftivism is vital. It turns us as well as our work into vessels of change. And finally, uh, by doing our work, we give other craftivists permission to make boldly, make with a greater good in mind, and make in order to nourish ourselves. So here I think that Betsy Greer has identified sort of four main components of craftivism. That making as an act is important. That creativity and permission, um, the act of giving ourselves permission to be creative and also to um, to resist, to stand up. Both involve um, pushing ourselves to move against the current of everyday life um, and you know, everyday kinds of expression. And that process is powerful, not just the result. Um, craftivism is outward facing and progressive in the sense that it works towards a better of bettering our circumstance and our community. But it's also inward facing and works towards nourishing our and expressing ourselves. So the first artist I wanna talk about is Dr. Sean Kimber. Dr. Kimber is a mathematician, academic dean and quilt artist. She helped revolutionize the contemporary quilt world with work which addresses the history of cotton production in the United States, which is inevitably a history also of slavery, and contemporary issues of racism and social justice. Her work has been shown and collected in both the quilting and art worlds, including um, in the This Pres Present Moment exhibition, which is currently up at the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery in Washington, DC. Dr. Kimber is from uh, Alabama, where her enslaved ancestors were made to pick, gin, and sew cotton. Her work um, is deeply concerned with this, with this history and legacy, but it also draws on the family tradition of using quilting as a method of self-expression, creativity, and ingenuity, and the quilts as source of comfort and protection against the cold. This quilt shows Kimber's genius with contradiction and juxtaposition. First of all, by combining the text and abstract imagery, she asks us to use two different ways of thinking in order to find meaning in the image. The text itself is readable only when we're no longer conscious of its form. If you can picture somebody just learning to read, um, they are acutely aware of each letter and the sound associated with each letter and making those associations is laborious because each step happens very consciously. But as we become fluent in reading, we no longer see the form, that transition from form to sound to word to meaning happens instantaneously. So it is almost as if the form of the text becomes invisible to us. However, at a field of abstract forms, like we see here behind the text is readable. We only can find the meaning in it when we let ourselves see only the form and color and rhythm of the shapes. In fact, when we sort of stop trying to read it, stop trying to find um, identifiable imagery, for example, that's when this, the shapes themselves and their rhythm, their pattern, their, um, their connections with one another uh, start to be full of meaning. There are also double meanings within the text itself. Um, the word essence, for example, as she uses it, could either mean in summary, in short, or in totality. The word sophisticated is a complicated loaded word here as well, because it suggests on the one hand, her very um, clear self-awareness of, um, of contemporary artist, uh, contemporary art, um, uh, expectations in which there will be some kind of self-commentary available in the work itself, um, a kind of double presence of the artist, but also sophisticated implies a kind of access to cultural and educational experiences that, as we all know, is not um, equitably available to everybody. And then finally, there's this very loaded phrase, cotton picker, loaded with meaning, I mean. Um, the phrase cotton picker is deeply redolent of this dark, you know, founding history um, of, our, of our country, which is slavery. 
and the cotton plantations that so many enslaved people were forced to work on. Um, but it also has this contemporary active meaning in the sense that it, it gives us a sort of tactile reminder of what she's doing, Dr. Kimber herself with her hands as she is making this quilt. So this phrase, which seems relatively straightforward, maybe at first glance, actually flickers back and forth between historical meanings and contemporary ones, between um, recognition of her place in the academic world and also recognition of the realities of inequality in our country and the sense of, you know, the complex way identity forms our, our sense of ourselves. These juxtapositions also force us to sit with this image, sorting through the meanings. It has the kind of slow reflective speed of some fine art, the message of activism and the techniques of craft. And by the way, when I use the, the terms fine art and craft, I have, um, I have deep resistance to the hierarchical sense of fine art being above craft. Um, so I don't imply any kind of hierarchical uh, meaning there. Um, but I do think that they have somewhat different characteristics and expectations. Um, so that's what I'm referring to. Um, so here's the second quilt of Kimber's. And this is actually the piece that is uh, currently in the Renwick. And to me, this piece speaks of the despair we often feel when we're confronted with acute injustice, um, when it's so hard to believe that our small actions will make a difference. Because this quilt, more than any of the others, shows us the value of slowing down, the power of many small acts. This quilt with the text, it's, it's so easy to look at these four words and feel like you have understood uh, what the text says and means. But it's actually only when you slow down, way down, that you see the complicated multi-layered sets of meanings that she creates with just these four words. If you think about it, if you read the quilt with this kind of slow intentionality, you get I, I am, I am still, I am not still, I am still not free. And already we see these layers of identity, of self, of self within the larger whole, of movement and stillness, liberation of existence and denial of liberation. The juxtapositions here are profoundly energetic and powerful to me and set against this object, which by nature of her incredible virtuosic skill in, in piecing and quilting uh, required an unimaginable amount of time and so many individual stitches, so many small acts of creation in order to make that there is this kind of monumental slowness about this piece that um, I find increases its power tremendously. Finally, the last quilt I wanna talk about is um, the one for Eric G, which she made in 2015. This quilt is a response to the death of Eric Garner, a black man killed by an N New York City police officer using a chokehold in 2014. Kimber describes in an interview watching the video of his death over and over in order to make sure she had counted the number of times he says, I can't breathe correctly. In this quilt, she is asking us again to sit with the words to sit with the words of a dying man, repeating the words just as he did. The power of this quilt comes from the combination of images and text. The phrase becomes a symbol of the man himself. It brings us, it reminds us of his presence and his unfortunate later identity as the man who died in this particularly terrible way. And once we see the phrase as a symbol of the man, the way it's repeated and the change in color and spacing and level moves us through life into his death. And it is, uh, I think, a very powerful piece. 
Finally, Kimber also feels, as Betsy Greer mentions, um, that uh, communal support and self-nurture are important parts of her work. She shares her pieces often on Instagram, social media. She used to have a, a quilting blog that was widely, hugely popular. Um, and she uses self social media in creating and connecting with the community and spreading the message. Another artist who uh, also uses social media is a profound part of her, um, integral part of her project is Diana Waymar. Um, she is a Canadian artist, maker and activist who's lived and studied extensively in the US. Her description of this project, the Tiny Pricks Project, identifies a number of juxtaposition, acts of creativity in response to uncertainty, the permanence of objects as opposed to impermanence of social media, specifically Twitter, the quality of textiles, warm, traditional, handmade, set against the frequent hostility and unreliability of President Trump's words and actions. Uh, the Tiny Pricks Project began with Waymar stitching a quote from President Trump, I'm a very st stable genius, onto a textile and then posting it online. The project quickly turned into a collaboration with others stitching and sending their pieces to Waymar for posting and exhibiting. Each piece empowered the next. The pieces resonated with viewers, making individuals seen, feel seen and their feelings validated. And the rapidly growing community made each act feel important and the makers feel more powerful and become more powerful, just as Greer describes. As Diana Waymar said in an Instagram post, she began this project because I love words and hated what Donald Trump did with them. Pieces like this one show the power of text and image combined. These pieces show the context of the text. Here, the phrase, believe me, I can fix it alone is potentially innocuous, but surrounded by the garish but amorphous face, the large cartoonish mouth, the phrase seems both ridiculous and ominous. Once the Trump presidency ended, Waymar began looking for other texts that she felt were powerful and relevant to the moment. And here's a, a lovely quote from artist uh, Louise Bourgeois, the act of sewing is a process of emotional repair. Finally, we get to my work, not finally. <laughs> um, uh, here is my bio. Um, I am uh, an, a multidisciplinary artist. I work with lots of different kinds of materials and my work um, also is centers on juxtaposition and, and conflict uh, within the work. Here is a piece I made called Sentimentality is a Mask for Cruelty. The, the text is a quote from James Baldwin as used by Dr. Eddie Gloud in his talk um, at the during the Stowe Prize Award um, at the Stowe Center in 2021. I have made several bodies of work with social justice issues at the core, primarily centering on my own family history, whiteness and white privilege. Um, it's in this kind of work where I come most, combi most often combine text and textile. I think I need the immediacy and directness of words in addition to the slower languages, language of images. These three pieces um, are of my response to something that happened last spring here in Washington, DC, where I live. Um, last spring, a sniper shot hundreds of rounds into my daughter's school. He was set up on a high floor across the street with multiple long guns and boxes of ammunition. He had a clear view into the main artery of the school through its floor to ceiling windows and to, and to the main exit. He waited until pickup time to open fire. My daughter and I were in the car in front of the school when it began and didn't, but did not understand what we were hearing and left unharmed. Other students and staff who were still in the school were besieged for hours, some of them severely wounded. Of the people who were shot, two will never fully recover. Thankfully, no one was killed. As we readied the school for the students' return several weeks later, I made these the banners on the left to hang in the main meeting space. The hanging on the right quotes the last line of a powerful poem written by one of the teachers, Sean Felix, about his experience of the shooting. And finally, I just wanted to touch quickly on a project of mine that I'm working on now called the Invisible Work Project. 
um, as I emerged from the isolation of the past few years, I realized and began to reconnect with my women friends. I realized that many of us had a list, a shorthand um, description of the things that they've been dealing with. Um, and it was shorthand for the intense struggles and efforts of that this particular time that we're sort of still in, hopefully moving through. Um, and I became more and more struck by just the enormity of the labor that had gone into these women's uh, that these women had been had been doing in this time, taking care of themselves and their families, other people, um, while at the same time negotiating work and um, you know all health concerns, all the other things that were going on um, in this uh, context of social injustice. Uh, uh, you know, contagion, et cetera. And I wanted to make this work visible. So I created a survey asking those identifying as women to share their lists. I then stitched their words onto fabric panels made up um, used but clean uh, sheets. So here's an example of uh, one of the survey response responses. Um, people were able to respond anonymously or they could leave their name if they wanted. So in this one, for example, I selected the phrase, um, I was struck by the phrase depression in my middle schooler. So that's what's here on this text. Um, this next one, um, I read through the submission and there were so many different kinds of loss that I ultimately felt it was best represented just by counting the times that this woman used the word loss and just representing that, that this submission was so full of loss that that was the best way I could, I could represent it. Um, these are two more examples. The left one, it's a little hard to read at the scale, but it says continuous waves of overwhelming news. And the one on the right says only breadwinner. So finally, this is a, another another uh, piece by Diana Waymar. Um, we stitch in order to do something, in order to center ourselves, to join with others, to make, to speak out, to resist, to nurture, to change, because we, like our work, are all of these things. And that is it. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>